Great, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's uh, uh, really wonderful to be here at this, this symposium. I'm happy to have the invitation to talk today. Um, and it's, it, it's great to hear about, uh, you know, all the exciting work and the ambitious goals in this, in this Moonshot program. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about today is uh, a, um, a, a joint research effort between my, my lab at Syracuse University, uh, here, yes, and the, the, uh, the group of, of Robert McDermott at, w, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, our groups have collaborated very closely for many years. And the, the particular work I'll be telling you about today is about developing some new techniques for addressing some of the, the long-term challenges, or long-term, actually, ones that are starting to come up now, uh, with, with scaling to really large systems of supernetting qubits, so going well, well beyond uh, where, where the state of the art is uh, right now. Okay, and so just to set the stage, uh, you know, supernetting qubits have enjoyed a really uh, impressive rise in performance over the past few decades. Uh, you know, going back to the very first supernetting qubit developed here in Japan at NEC uh, back in 1999. This is a, a plot out of a review article from the MIT group from several years ago, uh, showing that this exponential rise in coherence over the past, you know, well, when this article was written, about 20 years, uh, and so you know, five, almost six orders of magnitude. Increase, whoa, didn't mean to do that. Maybe I'll stop. Uh... Yeah. Is that better? Maybe that's about it. All right, maybe I'll stop clicking that way. Um, and, uh, right, so people are, are still working on trying to make uh, better coherence uh, and, uh, you know, hi higher fidelities. That's not what I'm going to talk about today, but that's certainly a, a very important uh, ongoing research topic from, from many groups. Uh, what I'm going to focus today on are challenges with scaling to, to large systems, right? So this this rise in coherence and getting up to this this uh, you know hundreds of microsecond or beyond hundreds of microsecond uh, coherence times has enabled pretty large scale systems, right? So we, we've seen already a few pictures uh, the last two days. Uh, say the, the Google chip from a few years ago, the, the 53 qubit uh, Sycamore chip, and I guess one of the latest IBM ones from earlier this year, the Osprey chip that has 433 qubits. Uh, and, you know, groups are working towards initial steps of, of error correction. Uh, but, you know, to, to really make a large-scale fault-tolerant quantum computer, we need many more qubits than this. And that uh, has a lot of challenges associated with it. And let me, okay, get out of this mode here. I'll see. There we go. Okay. So, you know, building any uh, uh, quantum computer, large-scale fault-tolerant quantum computer in any platform is really, really, really hard. Um, but... I'm coming from the superacting qubit world, so let's focus on some of the specific challenges uh, to making a, a large-scale superacting qubit. And in particular, I want to talk about the, the overhead challenges uh, associated with, with controlling and reading out qubits. So th the devices, the examples we looked at on the previous slide from, from Google and from IBM, those are transmon-based processors, uh, and all of the control and readout involves microwave signals. Uh, so we have to look at sort of the, the budget then for, for microwave hardware we need to operate a system. So I'm drawing here a very rudimentary, um, simple, just two qubit systems. So there, there's two transmon qubits here and here. A couple do a common readout resonator down here. Uh, and let's look at what we need to, to control this. So each qubit needs its own microwave source. It needs an arbitrary waveform generator. It needs a mixer. These are you know, relatively big piece of electronics that have to sit outside of the fridge. To read out the, uh, the qubits, we need another uh, arbitrary waveform generator, microwave source, and mixer to make the, the probe signal that's going to probe the readout cavity. And then over here, we need to also be able to, to detect that, that probe signal through the cavity. So we need uh, room temperature amplifiers. We need a, a mixer. We need another local oscillator. We need a digitizer. Uh, and then in the fridge, uh, we, need, we need very good low noise amplification. So we need a, a near quantum limited parametric amplifier, which requires another local oscillator, another microwave source uh, for a pump. We need a hemp, which we heard about earlier, dissipates power at the three Kelvin stage. These quantum limited amplifiers need uh, large, bulky, magnetic, heavy uh, isolators to protect the, the qubits down here from the pump signals and from back action from the amplifiers. Uh, and I realized I should have been highlighting these as I, I went along, but I'll do it now. 
Uh, we also need cables to bring the signals in and out. Cables, you know, don't only conduct electrical signals, they also conduct heat, which is bad for your fridge. Uh, and so basically th these are all the, the, the challenges we have to deal with. And now that's a two qubit system, so you want to make a million qubit system. You need a whole lot of this stuff out here, which is, is not easy. Um, but this works really, really well. And, you know, for a long time now, it's been possible to get very high gate fidelities and very high readout fidelities. Uh, this is some work already many years ago now from the IBM group and from the Google group on just few qubit systems where they're able to get, you know, better than three nines uh, gate fidelities. Uh, and also readout fidelities with 99% with or better have also been possible for, for, for several years now. So, you know, why would we want to do anything differently? Well, because it's hard to make a million copies of this uh, in, in a lab. So, you know, what's, what's an alternative to this? Well, my collaborators and I, for several years now, have been trying to think about alternatives to this. And uh, our, our picture is summarized in this paper we wrote uh, back in 2018. And the idea is to try to take this microwave hardware that's outside of the fridge and try to miniaturize it and move it inside the fridge with, with cryogenic electronics, and in particular, superconductor-based classical uh, digital uh, cryogenic electronics. So if we can have a, a superconducting-based processor, coprocessor, say running at 3 Kelvin in the fridge, but at 3 Kelvin where there's a lot more cooling power than down at the millikelvin stage, and then uh, talk to the qubits digitally, so to make this work, we need a digital way to control the qubits rather than the usual microwave-based approach uh, that, that's done in the current state of the art. We also need a way to digitally read out the qubit state and send digital, you know, classical digital signals back and forth then bet between this coprocessor, this classical coprocessor running at 3 Kelvin. And so I'm going to try to talk about both of these today, but let's start out on the left side talking about how we could digitally control qubits, uh, superconducting qubits. Okay, and the, the, the idea for this system is based on a, on a technology that's been around for, for quite some time now. Uh, so since back in the early 1990s, uh, this is what's called single flux quantum uh, superconducting logic. And the, the idea here is it's, it's, it's a classical logic family. It's based on, on Joseph's injunctions. And this is one of the simplest uh, type, of, type of elements, something called a Josephson transmission line, or JTL. And the, the logical states for, for the, these uh, SFQ circuits is either the, the uh, presence of a propagating fluxon. So uh, a fluxon is, is a flux of, of just this quantized amount, Planck's constant over two electron charges. So a propagating fluxon through this chain corresponds to logical one, and no propagating fluxon corresponds to logical zero. So very simple. Uh, and just to look a little bit more at this, this flux quantum, in case you're not familiar with the, these units, well, of course, you know, these, these constants, but if we think in kind of funny uh, units that the Josephson physicists would, would, would consider, is about two millivolts and a picosecond, okay? So, so you get a pulse height of about a, a millivolt or two in a time scale of a few picoseconds. Um, now, this, this is a very low power consumption logic. It's not zero, so it is dissipative, uh, but, it's, but it's very, very low power compared to, say, cryo CMOS, uh, which is probably the, the closest competitor. Um, and there have been you know, large-scale efforts to develop this in the U.S. and in Europe, and also, very importantly, here, here in Japan. Um, and this, 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 tech, this, this system, this logic family, is, is, is fairly advanced now. But now how can we apply this to, to, measure, to controlling qubits? And so my, my collaborators at Wisconsin uh, came up with this, this interesting idea uh, several years ago, described in this, this paper here. Uh, and so the idea is initially to think of putting uh, an SFQ element that can generate the, these SFQ pulses, the, these picosecond uh, narrow pulses, uh, and say millivolt scale in, in amplitude, uh, put that generator, so think about this here as this voltage source, make it coupled by a very weak capacitance, say hundreds of attofarads, to a superconducting qubit over here. And this, as I've drawn it, isn't even a qubit. It's just an LC oscillator. But imagine this inductor is a, is a Josephson junction. Okay? And so if we can irradiate the qubit with a periodic train of these pulses, then something interesting can happen. So if we consider the qubit dynamics on the block, state, on, on the block sphere, let's, let's say we initialize in the zero state up at the north pole. If we hit the qubit with one of these SFQ pulses, Again, it's coupled very weakly through the capacitance. It's going to tip the, the, the state vector just a small angle on the block sphere, say to here, to this latitude. But the qubit's going to process, of course, about the block sphere at its, its 
its transition frequency, the O1 transition frequency. And if we hit it again with the second pulse, at precisely the time where it comes back to its first place, uh, its original uh, longitude, now we can tip it again by the same angle. It's going to process again, and we can keep, tip, keep tipping it, and it'll go around and around. And in not too many pulses, say, if, if you choose a parameters rate, maybe 50 or 100 pulses, you can get a pi rotation. And that's going to take tens of nanoseconds, 10 or 20 nanoseconds, right on par with uh, conventional microwave uh, uh, based control. But this is a very different way of controlling a qubit. You know, if we think of conventional uh, microwave based control, uh, and let's have the, maybe the analogy of thinking like a, a playground swing and pushing a child on a playground swing, microwave based control would be like having your, your hand on, on the back of the child and sort of pushing them continually throughout the swing to try to build up the, the, the swing. So you're trying to pushing on the natural resonance of that swing. Whereas this digital control here is maybe actually a little more natural if you were pushing a playground swing, which is you're just going to push with a sharp pulse, maybe not too sharp, but sharp enough to get it moving, but at the right time. Right? When the swing is coming back towards your hand, you give it a push, the kid swings up, and when they come back, you push again, and you can ring up the, the swing oscillations in that way. So both techniques work, but they're, they're different. You know, continuous versus, versus digital control. Okay, and so... We've worked now for, for, for several years on uh, implementing this, and our first approach to implement this w went between our, our, our two labs uh, and doing an all-university, all-grad student uh, fab approach, uh, which was challenging, but we, we made it work. Uh, and so we, we did this sort of a hybrid approach where, where Robert's group in Madison made the, these SFQ elements for building a, a rudimentary SFQ circuit for doing this coherent driving control. Uh, and these are niobium uh, aluminum oxide-based junctions. They would then send the wafers to my lab in Syracuse. We would then pattern the, the qubit junctions, which are very low critical current density uh, aluminum, aluminum oxide uh, tunnel junctions. And then we'd dice the, the wafer up into chips and keep half of them in Syracuse and the other half to Madison and do parallel sets of experiments. And so just to point out some th features on the chip, if I can, uh, the qubit is, is up here. Its readout resonator goes off to the left. The SFQ driver is, is down here. It's, it's a basic uh, DC to SFQ converter. And the pulses on the, the SFQ uh, line come out on this antenna here, which then couples through the, a weak capacitance from this electrode up to the qubit island. Okay. And so after we, we fabricated these, we measured them and showed that this technique works. So what we were doing initially is just triggering the SFQ with a microwave signal, uh, which would not be the long-term plan, but just for demonstrating, for proof of principle, we can trigger the SFQ with, with a microwave, but each microwave cycle makes one SFQ pulse come out of it. And so what we're looking at in this measurement on the left is driving the, the SFQ signal, at, in this case, a subharmonic of the qubit. This is omega over three, so a third of the qubit transition frequency, uh, as a function of the bias to this, this SFQ element and also the drive time for the, the micro pulse that we're triggering the SFQ circuit with. And we can see it at, at low biases, nothing happens. The SFQ isn't able to emit pulses. But when we get above this critical threshold, we now begin to see Rabi oscillations. The color scale here is just the, the probability to find the qubit in the one state. Uh, and so, and if, if we bias too high, then, then we switch the, the SFQ circuit out into the normal state and it doesn't work anymore. Um, you know, why do we uh, drive on subharmonics? This is to avoid, because these initial experiments were doing a microwave-based triggering of the SFQ, we don't want to have microwaves just leapfrog directly to the qubit and excite the qubits with microwaves, so we can trigger on a subharmonic, which is like we tip on the block sphere, and now instead of processing once, we process twice or three times or even four times, and then tip again. So it makes the pulse longer, but it gets rid of this, this direct crosstalk problem. And this is looking at three different subharmonics here the first part of the cycle of a Rabi oscillation for each one. Okay, so this was exciting for us. It worked. It, it was great. Uh, but then we were able to tune up uh, a full Clifford set of, of gates and run randomized benchmarking. And, you know, we could see, okay, it, it works, but the, the decay is, is pretty quick for those who are used to looking at RB curves. Uh, but we're still able to extract a fidelity. Uh, and the fidelity, the, the gate errors are something like about 5%. So, Okay, it's definitely not 99.99% uh, fidelity. is you know, 0.01%, but 5%. Um, it works, but it's, it's got relatively high errors. So what's the, the limiting factor? It turns out we're limited by what you might guess, which is, is quasi-particle generation. Uh, so quasi-particles that are generated by the operation of the SFQ element, those quasi-particles can then poison the qubit and degrade the, the coherence of the qubit, uh, which then uh, degrades the, the, the fidelity of the gates. 
Uh, and so let me make an aside for just a minute, since this is an audience with, with a range of different, different backgrounds, uh, and just talk for one slide about quasi-particles in, in superconductors. So a uh, superconductor is, is characterized by this gap in the single particle excitation spectrum. So if we, if we look here at the, we're plotting the density of states in our superconductor uh, and energy here on the vertical axis, and there's this gap, uh, delta, where there are no single particle excitations. So the superconductor is characterized by this, this ground state of these condensed Cooper pairs that live at zero energy, or zero energy relative to the Fermi energy, at least. And that's what's great about, about superconductors and why it's, it's, it's really nice to, to use them to make uh, qubits. But if you add energy into the system, if you raise the temperature of the superconductor, or if you have, uh, say, uh, extra energy coming from, from high energy photons or um, uh, high energy phonons, either of those, those uh, quanta can break a Cooper pair. And when a Cooper pair gets broken, it generates a pair of quasi-particles, and those two quasi-particles necessarily have to live above this, this energy gap, so up above delta here. And the problem is quasi-particles are dissipative. They carry entropy when they move, unlike the Cooper pairs. And so when you have excess quasi-particles in, in and around the qubit junctions, they degrade the qubit coherence, and so they're bad. So we'd like to have, ideally, no, no quasi-particles. Um, and just to put a number on things, this typical energy scale delta for a superconductor uh, is between, say, a tenth of a millielectron volt up to maybe one millielectron volt in that, in that uh, ballpark. Or if you like to think in frequency units, for the aluminum junctions that we use, uh, this, this delta is about uh, 40 or 50 gigahertz. So two deltas is, is about 100 gigahertz. Uh, so now when you have excess quasi-particles, one mechanism that can happen is they can also, one quasi-particle can find a partner quasi-particle and they can recombine. And when two quasi-particles recombine, they form a Cooper pair again, and that then emits the phonon. It now has to give off this phonon of exactly two delta of energy. That phonon can then actually couple into the substrate that the superconducting chip is sitting on, and it can propagate very efficiently uh, through the substrate. And so the next few slides are talking about a phonon-mediated poisoning mechanism, uh, which is was what uh, in, in our initial experiments with this SFQ-based control limits the, the, the performance of these gates. Um, and so we've also studied this, this phonon-mediated poisoning uh, in, in, in several different contexts. We first looked at this uh, back here in this uh, bottom article here from 2017, where we were looking at superconducting aluminum resonators with tunnel junctions on a chip for injecting phonons. We did this by, by biasing the tunnel junctions up above their, their, their gap, which makes a lot of quasi-particles. These quasi-particles uh, can then recombine. When they recombine, as I mentioned before, they emit phonons, two delta phonons that go into the substrate and bounce around throughout the silicon, and they can travel to remote regions throughout the chip. And when they hit the superconducting film somewhere else, they can then break a pair and make excess quasi-particles remotely. Okay, and so more recently, just last year in this paper, we were studying this problem, now not in resonator arrays, but in, in qubit arrays. We were focusing on, on three qubits on this particular chip, and again, using tunnel junctions to inject the phonons. And what we could see is if we injected a pulse of phonons by pulsing the bias to this injector junction, the blue one over here on the side, uh, we could see that the, the T1, or the inverse T1 here, increases, so, so coherence gets worse, and it gets worse over some time scale. It takes about 30 microseconds or so for the phonons to propagate from this, this tunnel junction, say, over to, to one of these, these qubits. And then T1 is maximally bad about here, and then it begins to recover on longer time scales as the phonons leave the system and the chip cools off from that, that burst of energy we sent in. Now, we also studied this, this process not just from injection, but also from, from impacts of, of gamma rays and, and, and cosmic ray muons, but especially gamma rays coming from just background radioactivity in the lab. Uh, and that turns out to also be, to be a problem, but we could study it with this system uh, because a gamma ray hitting the chip also makes a large burst of phonons. It also gives an offset charge jump, which Alex was just talking about in, in the previous presentation, but it, it causes many, many phonons to go throughout the system and cause the quasi-particle poisoning. And what we showed in this paper last year was that by adding uh, normal metal, so copper islands, onto the back side of the chip, we could absorb a lot of the energy from these phonon bursts and greatly reduce uh, the, these poisoning effects, either from injected phonons from our tunnel junction or from gamma rays on, on the chip, or gamma rays hitting the chip. 
Uh, and so, so that, that's an interesting, <laughs> promising path forward. But in the case of our SFQ processor, another approach besides putting normal metal on the backside of the chip is just simply separating things into multiple chips. And so this is something we worked on o over the past year or two, uh, now not just with my lab and, and Robert's lab, Wisconsin and Syracuse, but also with the, the superconducting electronics team at NIST Boulder. Uh, and this is to now make a, a multi-chip type of structure, so shown uh, here with uh, a sort of a quantum chip that's on top, which is this one here that has just the qubits and the readout resonators on it, and then a bigger classical chip on the bottom, which is shown down here, which has kind of everything else. So it's got the, the SFQ elements, which are a little bit too small to see, but they're, they're down here. Uh, the, the DC to SFQ converters, the, the wiring lines for, for biasing those, for triggering those, and also the flux bias line for the qubits, and a readout line for detecting the, the readout resonator signals from the qubit. So this quantum chip gets flipped up, upside down and gets bonded with indium bumps onto this classical chip down below. Okay, so this is, this is the idea. There's this multi-chip structure which will separate the two chips. So the, the fabrication gets easier because you can optimize the fab for making really high coherence qubits. Separately from the fab, you need to make these uh, higher, much higher critical current density uh, single flux quantum junctions for, for making a classical control chip. Um, and, you know, we, we've tuned these up and measured them, and, and this, this works. Uh, here, here's just an example measurement of, of a Robbie Chevron. In this case, it's driving on the fourth subharmonic of the qubit transition. The qubit's also up around five gigahertz, so we're driving at a fourth of that. And now we can also tune up you know, the Clifford set and do RB, randomized benchmarking, and now the decay is, is slower than, than our, our previous iteration a couple years earlier. Uh, and we can pull out uh, gate fidelities, and now the average gate fidelity is down close to about half a percent. So, you know, we made a pretty big improvement in separating the chips. We got rid of this phonon-mediated poisoning mechanism. Phonons can't get from this bottom chip up into the top chip, and we, we got things down by about an order of magnitude. But, okay, we're still not at, uh, you know, 0.1% or 0.01%. Uh, so what's, what's limiting us, it turns out it's still quasi-particles, but it's not quasi-particles that are generated by this phonon-mediated mechanism. It's quasi-particles generated by a photon-mediated mechanism, which I'll, I'll describe a little bit here. Uh, so this is something that, that uh, Robert McDermott's uh, group uh, came up with, uh, realized just, just in the last couple years, uh, that, okay, if we think about a typical supernatant qubit structure, we're trying to make this, this uh, shunt capacitor and basically make an anharmonic L LC oscillator that works at, say, 5 gigahertz. Uh, in this picture, the, the light-shaded uh, material is, is the metal. The black is regions where the metal is etched away, and you see the substrate. So this, this plus sign, its capacitance to ground, is enough capacitance to get a good oscillator around 5 gigahertz. The yellow is the Joseon junction down here highlighted. Uh, it's not really yellow. Um, but the, the realization in this, this uh, recent paper from Robert's group is that, okay, if you think of this spherical cow approximation for your qubit here, uh, this type of patch, metallic patch embedded in, a, in an aperture through Babinet's principle of, of antenna uh, theory can be mapped onto a wire loop antenna. And so you can think about currents flowing around this wire loop, and the fundamental resonance of this wire loop is going to be set by you know, one lambda being the round trip path around this loop. And for typical qubit geometries, that resonance is in the range of 100 or 200 gigahertz, so millimeter wave frequencies, way, way higher than the five gigahertz we're trying to make our qubit in. So this is not intended, but it's, it's kind of there. And it turns out, unfortunately, this, this antenna impedance is actually a very good and a very efficient match to the impedance of the Joseon junction. So if there are these millimeter wave photons hanging around in the qubit environment, this spurious antenna mode of the qubit can resonantly absorb these photons and make huge currents going back and forth at these very high frequencies, higher than the superconducting gap, through the Joseon junction, breaking pairs and making quasi-particles. And so we, we studied this in experiments uh, between, between Robert's group and, and, and my group. Uh, Looking at a receiver qubit here that we can we can measure its poisoning uh, in in this case by measuring something called the quasi particle parity switching rate as a function of millimeter waves that we arrayed the qubit with that we're using actually another Joseph's injunction on a separate chip up here about almost 10 millimeters above, to broadcast narrowband uh, millimeter waves at hundreds of gigahertz uh, down to the qubit. And basically, by sweeping the bias voltage of this, this junction up here, we can select the frequency that we irradiate this, this receiver qubit with. And so what we could do is measure this, this quasi-particle parity switching rate. When this number is high, it means the qubit's really getting poisoned strongly. When it's low, it means it's, it's relatively quiet. 
as a function of the frequency that we're broadcasting. So we're basically doing this, this spectroscopy up at hundreds of gigahertz uh, of the qubit, and we can see, okay, the, these peaks and, and uh, you know, wiggle structures that match actually very well with the, 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 the numerical model for this, this amp antenna impedance. Uh, and so you know, th this shows a way that you can have this, this photon-mediated quasi-particle poisoning. So coming back to the SFQ, uh, you know, what does this mean? Well, here's a, a, a um, numerically simulated plot of the, the resonant structures. And I, I should point out, this was described in a, in a paper uh, that's a preprint that's on the archive from earlier this year, uh, describing this, this multi-chip module. I think, uh, oh, there we go. Um, Okay, and you can see that there's a lot of uh, structure out here at around, you know, two or 300 gigahertz or so. But these SFQ pulses, as we said at the beginning, they're very narrow in time, right? They're sort of picosecond or a couple picoseconds wide. So in the Fourier domain, domain that means these are very broad band, right? They have spectral weight out to hundreds of gigahertz. So if the spectral weight of this pulse is overlapping with this resonant structure, you're going to have exactly this photon-mediated poisoning problem. So there's now, now that we understand this, there's a clear solution sort of in the next generation of these experiments of just changing the SFQ parameters a little bit, making little, somewhat maybe factor of two or three lower bandwidth SFQ pulses to say get down here. And that's a, not much of a sacrifice from the control standpoint. This is still a very short time scale compared to the qubit precession period. And then try to make even more compact qubits to push this structure up higher and get these further apart. And that should mitigate this photon-mediated poisoning mechanism. Uh, so then we should be able to reach uh, gate, gate errors down of 0.1% of and, and then even below and start to really compete with, with conventional microwave-based control. Okay, so uh, in the last part of the talk here, I want to now uh, go to the other side of this picture. Okay, so we talked about digital control, but how about a digital readout? Uh, and so in contrast to, to conventional circuit QED readout, which we heard a lot about from uh, Alex's talk right beforehand, uh, so, so in, in uh, conventional microwave-based readout, you're sending in a microwave probe tone to this readout cavity, and the readout cavity gets a dispersive shift depending on the state of the qubit, and so by carefully amplifying that up and then using a room temperature mixer, a microwave source uh, to downconvert this, you can look at this, this phase displacement of that probe signal in the IQ plane. So these clouds displacing one way or the other, depending if you were qubits in the zero one state. But this you know, requires very careful amplification and it requires room temperature hardware. You need this mixer outside of the fridge. You need a local oscillator. You need a digitizer. You don't get the measurement result until the signal's outside of the fridge. So we're going to try a, a different approach based on a, on, a, on a photon detection scheme. So if we can somehow map the qubit state onto the photon occupation in this cavity, so not a dispersive phase shift, but whether you have a large number of photons or ideally vacuum, then now you could, in, in the IQ plane, you could say either have vacuum or a large number of photons, and if you can somehow discriminate that, uh, then you could read out your qubit digitally, and you could, in principle, do that in the fridge. And we're going to use something based, uh, something that we'll call the Josephson photomultiplier that was developed a, a while back. And this is a, a Josephson junction-based based circuit that can detect the presence of microwave photons and give an electrical click, so, so uh, e either a voltage pulse or a flux pulse when a, a photon is absorbed. Uh, okay, and these are some, some papers with our, our theory collaborators from, from the early days when we first started trying to think about this, this uh, uh, photon uh, detection measurement scheme. Okay, and let me go into to some more detail now of how you might actually uh, implement this, this readout scheme. And I'll, I'll point to two, two papers from our collaboration, and you'll recognize the, the, the name. So Alex, uh, when, he, when he was a grad student in Wisconsin, he, he did some really excellent work, pioneering work, uh, on, on this, this scheme for this, this photomultiplier-based readout described in these, these two papers here. Um, so he, here's the, the basic idea now, just a little more graphically than what I said in words before. So we, we can think of our readout cavity for our, our qubit as having these, these two different resonances dispersively shift depending on if the qubit's in the zero state or the one state. And now if we, say, drive this resonance when the qubit, for, for the, the frequency where uh, the cavity would be shifted if the qubit's in the one state, then if the qubit actually is in the one state, we'll just build up a bunch of photons and proceed out here uh, along, you know, radially out in the IQ plane. But if we're still driving on this frequency, but the qubit's in the zero state, so we're now going to be driving the cavity off resonance by this amount, the IQ blob 
for the cavity, it's going to now go through the circular orbit in the IQ plane. And if we drive for just the right amount of time so that that IQ blob comes back to the origin, then we now will have mapped the qubit state onto cavity photon occupation, right? So if the qubit was in the zero state, we will have ended up ideally with vacuum in the cavity, whereas if the qubit was in the one state, we would have ended up with a lot, say, tens of photons in the cavity. And so now we would have this picture, so mean photon number here, Two, two different uh, bars, one short, one tall, and if we can define some threshold in between and detect that, then we now get a, a measurement result in the fridge at, at the millikelvin stage. And so the, the JPM, this Josephson multi photomultiplier, is essentially, uh, I mean, for people that have been in the field for a while, this is something like a very old uh, phase qubit from you know, 20 years ago, uh, of, uh, flux shunted, or sorry, inductively shunted Josephson junction, and it has a, a potential well that looks like this, but if we tip the potential well, so it has, uh, you know, several levels here in one of the wells, if these transitions between these states are close or on resonance with the photon we want to detect, then if there are photons, the, the JPM is going to get excited up near the top of this barrier. If there are no photons, it'll hopefully stay in the, in the bottom of this well. And so if it gets to the top of the barrier, there's going to be a high probability, a high tunneling rate to escape over to this side, whereas if it's in this, this ground state, it's going to stay put there and hopefully have a very weak tunneling rate and not ever make it over here. But then if the JPM ends up here, it's going to correspond to say, a counterclockwise circulating current state in this loop, whereas if it stayed in the original well, it's going to be a clockwise circulating current state. So these are classically distinct states that we can easily uh, discriminate with, with some microwave reflectometry. Um, and so you know, we, we kind of did two passes at this experiment over a couple years on the course of, of Alex's PhD career. So this, this was generation one. Uh, we made some qubits at Syracuse. Uh, Alex and co made, made some JPMs in Madison. We had the two in separate boxes uh, coupled through a, a coax line uh, between them to transfer the photons from the qubit cavity over to a, a cavity on this JPM chip. Uh, and that, that worked pretty well. I'll show some results in a minute. But then generation two uh, was, was this technique where we integrated uh, the JPM and the qubits onto the same chip uh, with, with a react cavity. There's actually two copies of both on here, but we'll focus on just, just one of them. Uh, this is a picture of, of the JPM down here with its, its inductor, uh, the, the, um, the Josephson junction right here, the shunt capacitor. Uh, and then we can... Uh, tune the JPM frequency with the flux bias line, and the qubits then sit down here. They also have their own, their own flux bias line, so we can, we can set them to the frequency we want. And I think I'm going to probably skip across this slide, but this basically shows the process for, you know, there, there's multiple stages. We have to first map the, uh, the qubit state onto the cavity photon occupation. Then we have to sort of arm the, the JPM to get it so we can detect photons. And then once we have this classical measurement result, we just have to probe it. With the uh, with, with microwaves, okay. And so, in our original experiments back in 2018, you know, this worked. So we could measure these JPM uh, photomultiplier detected Rabi oscillations and Ramsey fringes. The fidelity was pretty good. We we got about 92% uh, single shot measurement fidelity in in 1.4 microseconds. But in generation two, uh, things improved by, by quite a bit. Uh, so, so now we're able to get up to 98.4% to uh, fidelity in, in under 500 nanoseconds. There's prospects for pushing that, that even a bit faster and, and pushing up even, even a bit higher in, in readout fidelity. But this is already pretty good. This is you know, close to being on par with, with a, a, a quantum limited amplifier readout, you know, TUPAs or IMPAs or, or, or uh, JPAs. Uh, but you, you get this measurement result at the bottom of the fridge, and we also thought about techniques for how you could then map the result from the JPM onto an SFQ digital signal to realize this dream of having you know, SFQ control and SFQ readout. Uh, and I won't go through the details, but this is, this is a way to do that. So here's your JPM, and here's an SFQ output that you get a one logical one for one state of the qubit and a logical zero for the other state of the qubit. Okay, and so you know, putting this all together, uh, again, uh, coming back to this, this original paper we, we wrote several years ago, the idea would be if, if you could do this and you could have a relatively large fridge with not even that much larger cooling power than what's available now, say 10 milliwatts at the millikelvin stage and 10 watts up at, up at the 3 kelvin stage, you could build this, this uh, picture of these SFQ-based uh, classical processors up here at 3 kelvin and the qubits and some number of SFQ elements at the bottom for the control and readout. And with the, this cooling power budget, you could actually operate 
up to 10 to the 8 qubits, so 100 million qubits. I'm not saying we did that, and, and we don't have any immediate plans to do that, but it, the, the numbers actually work out that uh, going through just the, the, uh, the, the power budget and, and also heat, heat budget from cabling up and down, uh, th th this could actually um, operate at that, that high of a number of qubits. Okay, and so just to, to summarize, uh, you know, I've, I've described to you some of the, the, the hardware challenges with building a really large scale um, microwave based uh, superconducting processor, so using conventional microwave control and, and readout. And I've described our, our, our two approaches for sort of alternative uh, digital-based schemes, so SFQ-based schemes on the control side and also on, on the readout side based on, on photon detection. Okay, so let me just, as the last slide, put up some acknowledgments of my group at Syracuse, uh, Robert's group in, in Madison, uh, the, the NIST group working with us on the, uh, this multi-chip module, uh, and, and several other collaborators that, that uh, uh, were very important over the years. So thank you for your attention.